Thanks for making it all the way to the last day of KubeCon and uh, hopefully sticking it out for uh, the full day of content that we've got today. Um, I really appreciate you coming here. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm a software engineer at Google. I'm also a ContainerD maintainer. And uh, today we're going to be talking about what ContainerD 2.0 means for you. So uh, with that said, ContainerD 2.0 is now available. Um, we <laughs> released it last week. It was a long time coming, but uh, we're really happy it's finally out now. Um, and we're going to spend you know, this whole session talking about it. So uh, I'm excited. I hope you are too. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit through the changes that have happened in Containerd2.0. Containerd2 um, also, we're going to touch on uh, why it's a major version, why we moved from 1.x to 2.0, and what that means in terms of some uh, deprecations and removals, you know, effectively breaking changes that are there. Uh, then we'll talk about um, how you can prepare to upgrade, what you can do to find out if you're going to be affected by any of the changes that have been made, uh, and how you can remediate anything where you can find help and, and then sort of directionally what's going on next. Um, I'm going to try to have some time for Q&A at the end, so I would ask you to please hold your questions until then. Um, also, the, all these slides are going to be online, um, so don't feel like you need to copy everything down or read every word while I'm talking, because um, it'll all be available for you to look at later as well. So uh, with that said, let's move on to what's new. Um, we do have a whole bunch of new stuff in ContainerD 2.0. We've got new features. We've got things that were previously experimental in ContainerD 1.7 that we've now stabilized. Uh, we've got some defaults that have changed a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go through everything that's on this list, but I want to touch on a couple things, and then we'll have some, some deeper highlights. Um, first thing, the, the transfer service and the sandbox service, these were experimental uh, things that we actually launched in ContainerD 1.7, and we have... Uh, now gone through and stabilized them, and they're ready for, for people to start really using. Um, we've got some improvements in performance in terms of things like image extraction, uh, some changes in how you can configure OTEL. Um, we've also got some new defaults, like uh, NRI turned on by default, CDI enabled by default, uh, and we have support for user namespaces, a, a very improved set of user namespaces compared to what we had before. Um, so I have a couple things that I want to do a, a sort of deeper highlight on. Um, that I'm particularly excited about. The first one is uh, Node Resource Interface, or NRI. Um, NRI is a, a mechanism for customizing the underlying container configuration beyond the kinds of things that you can do uh, in the pod spec or beyond the defaults that ContainerD is going to give you. Um, it's effectively middleware between the CRI layer, which is the layer that the kubelet uses to control the container runtime, and the OCI layer, which is the underlying implementation for Linux containers. Um, and it lets you do things like inject different devices, inject uh, network changes, um, do OCI hooks at that level. You can also do some really interesting things with resource resources, resource modification or resource management, um, including support for setting things like ULimits, which is not possible to do through the Kubernetes API today. Um, also, there's some really interesting things you can do with um, advanced CPU pinning. Um, actually, uh, Alexander Kanievsky from Intel had a talk yesterday uh, that talked really some, through some really interesting performance uh, things that they were able to do through an NRI plugin. Um, plugins can run as containers. They can run as system services. That means that you can actually deploy them through Kubernetes if you want, or you can have them installed, pre-installed and ready on your node as the node starts up. Um, we have a set of plugins that we have that we're maintaining, uh, sort of examples from the ContainerD maintainers, and then there's also a repository of community-maintained plugins. Um, both of those links are, are up there. But you know, an NR, NRI is just an interface, and anyone can write a plugin for it. That means that you can write your own plugins for it, or you can um, have proprietary plugins rather than open source plugins. It's a really neat extension mechanism for uh, customizing some really deep details of how containers run. Um, and it helps you really fully unlock all of the things that OCI can do, um, even if those aren't fully exposed through all of the APIs that Kubernetes has today. Next thing I want to highlight here, um, image verifier plugins. This is a new thing that we've introduced in 2.0. Um, these are plugins that can set policy for how images are pulled in ContainerD and decide whether or not a given image is allowed to be pulled or should not be pulled. And the use cases for things like this are things like signature enforcement or maybe pinning to specific uh, trusted providers for images or allowing only specific uh, registries or repositories. Or you could do things like deny uh, images where you found um, found vulnerabilities or found problems with them before. Uh, and it actually prevents ContainerD from even uh, loading the images in the first place, so then nothing 
that you don't want to run can actually run. Uh, we've integrated this with the transfer service, uh, which is the newly stable um, functionality that we in introduced in Continuity 1.7 and now is stable in 2.0. Um, transfer service is a, a newer mechanism for pulling uh, container images or pushing container images, transferring them around. Um, we don't have image verifier support for the legacy pull mechanism, and that does mean that, unfortunately, you can't really leverage it with Kubernetes yet, um, because the CRI implementation in Containerd is still using the older pull mechanism. We're expecting to change that in 2.1, so um, that'll come sort of relatively quickly. So I want to start, talk about some of the changes in there that we don't really think are breaking changes. They're just things that have moved around a little bit. Um, uh, the top two here are um, other interfaces for interacting with Containerd. Containerd has its own API surface that's a little bit different from Kubernetes. Um, and we've done sort of two changes to that that are relevant if you're integrating with Containerd directly. One is that we're versioning our own um, gRPC API now separately from Containerd itself. Um, what that means is that the, the protobuf API has not moved to uh, 2.0. That's still in um, a 1.x, and we actually moved it to 1.8. So from, from this point forward, the daemon version for Containerd and the API version are versioned a little bit separately. The reason that we did this is because we made no breaking API changes when we moved to Containerd 2.0. So the API itself has remained stable, and that remains on, on 1.x. The other thing is we moved the um, Go client library, which is a, a library that we have for doing um, sort of neat higher level things, leveraging a bunch of the Containerd gRPC APIs together, uh, out to a separate Go package. It used to be in the root Containerd Containerd namespace, and we've moved it to its own um, package namespace. We're expecting that most users of this Go package are just going to have to update the import paths and not really anything else. Um, Phil Estes, who's another Containerd maintainer who's sitting up in the front row, um, maintains another tool called Manifest Tool for manipulating multi-architecture container images. And he did his own migration just after we released Containerd 2.0, and it was just changing the import paths. He didn't have to do anything else with it. So we're expecting that to be relatively minor. The other sort of key thing here is, you know, the old client library and the old uh, API versions continue to work with Containerd 2.0. So there's no need to upgrade until you're ready to actually take on new features or, or interact with new things. Um, we have deprecated, but not yet removed, so this isn't a breaking change yet, uh, some of the configuration properties for CRI registries in the Containerd config file. Um, and we are going to be replacing all of them with things that you can use instead. We have replacements today for mirrors and configs. We don't yet have a replacement for auths. That's probably going to be something like a credential manager plugin that we'll do in uh, Containerd 2.1, and then these, these will be targeted for removal in 2.1 as well. Um, we've also deprecated Go plugin libraries. Um, this is a, a mechanism that the Go toolchain has for building dynamically linked um, .so files that can be loaded into the same process, sort of similar to how you would do that in C. Um, it has been a really challenging thing for people to use in Go, uh, and we're not actually really aware of anyone doing that with Continuity today. Um, so our plan right now is to remove that in 2.1. If you do happen to be using any of these uh, SO plugins, we'd love for you to reach out to us and talk to us. Um, make sure that we've got a replacement for you, or we can understand even how you've been able to make it work successfully. Um, we've also got a change in one of our uh, protobuf types, um, types.envelope, replacing uh, two other envelope types, um, but we haven't gone and removed any of those yet. So that was sort of the changes that we're expecting to not really be breaking, and then there are changes that uh, are, did justify a, a major version change from 1.x to 2.0. Um, so these are things that were previously deprecated that we have removed in the 2.0 release, or we've turned off by default in the 2.0 release. Um, removals can be scary. Uh, I want to talk through what the removals are and sort of mechanisms that you can use to understand your impact before we then talk about how you can uh, go and remediate any of those changes. So first thing, this is, this is a high-level list of the kinds of things that we have uh, removed in 2.0. This is also available on the Containerd website. We have a nice table that describes all of the, all of the changes and their replacements. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of these really briefly, and then um, we'll go deeper into some of them a little bit later. But uh, Docker Schema 1 image support and CRI v1 Alpha 2 API, these are sort of the two that might be a little bit more impacting to people, and I'll, I'll definitely be covering those. 
Um, the rest of them we're expecting to be relatively low impact or no impact. Uh, and even for the first two, we're expecting most users of Containerd won't really have to do anything at all. Um, so the next thing on here, uh, the no file, number of open files you limit. Um, we changed our uh, limit no file um, in our systemd unit that we vend as part of Containerd. Uh, this is a, a configuration that we don't really think everyone is using. Um, it's just the systemd unit file that we provide as part of our repo. And a lot of distributions that package Containerd provide their own anyway. So this may or may not be a change that is relevant and you'll have to actually look at your distribution to figure out what's going on there. Um, the reason that this is important is because ULimits actually do get inherited by the containers that Containerd runs. So a default that we've changed for Containerd, the daemon, does affect the defaults that are present inside your containers. Um, we've also started denying uh, IOU ring syscalls. Um, these have been involved in some kernel CVEs. Uh, even though they're a, a performance improvement over previous behavior, uh, they don't really introduce a lot of new functionality into Linux. And so we're expecting most applications that are using IOU ring syscalls are just going to fall back to the older implementations of the syscalls that are uh, relevant for the functionality they're trying to do. These are basically input-output operations generally. Um, Containerd has a, a concept called a shim, which is a component that sits between the Containerd daemon and the uh, actual container processes that are running. And we had three implementations of them in 1.x. Um, we've removed the two older implementations. So IO Containerd Runtime V1 Linux, which was the very first shim implementation that we had, and IO Containerd Run C V1 have both been removed and replaced by IO Containerd Run C V2. We've had Run C V2, I think, since at least 1.5, maybe 1.4. Um, so it's been in use and default for a long time. We're just removing the older ones. Um, we don't really expect there to be any functionality change for you as, as you're actually using anything, um, but it's something that you can be aware of. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why you want to look at this uh, in a, a couple slides. Um, we've also got uh, a restart.logpath label that was replaced by restart.logURI, effectively the same thing, just a different name for it. Um, we've removed an older, very old snapshotter for doing um, container image layers called AUFS that depended on a non-upstream kernel file system. And our recommendation at this point is the, the default is to use overlay instead, which most uh, should be available in most Linux distributions that are in any way modern. Um, and then we've also changed a little bit in our release tooling. We used to provide some CRI and CNI components in the release bundle uh, that container D, the Containerd project vended. And if you were downloading those directly, you'll now need to go to those respective projects to find those components instead of just getting them from Containerd. So that was a bunch of stuff. How do you know if you're going to be impacted? Um, in Containerd 1.6 and 1.7, we introduced a new um, deprecation service that goes and finds out whether or not you're using any of the things that are going to be removed, that were removed in 2.0, and tells you about them. These are usage-based warnings, so they will only show up if you're actually using any of the things that, that are there. You should not see any uh, false positives. It's only if you're actually using one of the things that's impacted that you'll find any warning, uh, which means that if you do find, if you do see the warning, you should expect to take some action. There's some sort of migration that you'll need to do. Um, you can retrieve these through the CTR deprecations list command. We actually have that as a machine readable JSON output as well. Uh, if you want to integrate with that into some tooling without having to have a full Containerd API client, um, we record information about when the thing was used and as much information as, as we can about what was used there. Um, these were introduced in patch releases of Containerd 1.6 and 1.7, so they're not available in the oldest patch releases of those, those slight, slightly newer ones. And we also had a, a period of time where we were um, making sure that those were refined properly. So right now, our, our recommendation is to use uh, 1.7.21 or 1.6.36 as the ones that have the accurate information about all of the deprecations recorded and when they were um, used. Uh, there is a, a note here that if you're looking at some of the ones that we have around config, those will always show the time that Containerd started because the config never changes while Containerd is alive. Um, but otherwise, you can look at, at what, the, what the time was and try to use that to correlate to uh, an event that happened in your cluster and figure out whether you're impacted. Um, this is kind of what that would look like, um, just a little bit of a, a screenshot showing what is a detailed message that you would get for a particular deprecation when it was, when it was occurred. And then you'll also see there's a specific um, machine-readable consistent identifier for each of the deprecations if you want to key that somewhere. Um, so 
Before we move into specific remediation stuff for some of the details here, I want to talk general upgrade patterns. Um, because we didn't introduce the deprecation service into some, until some patch releases of uh, 1.6 and 1.7, the first thing that you'd want to do is make sure you're using the latest or at least 1.7.21 or 1.6.36 releases of Containerd before you're really preparing to upgrade. And then go ahead and run your workloads. Make sure that your cluster is running normally. These are, you know, 1.6. 1636, 1721, or the later releases of them are fully supported uh, versions of Containerd, and so anything that you're running today should still work with those. So you should be fine to update to those without worrying about anything. And then as your workloads will run, Containerd will start to record what's going on with, um, with these features if you're going to be hit by any of those deprecations. Then you'll look at, at the warnings, um, and if you have anything that shows up, you'll, fig you'll need to go ahead and remediate them. Um, some of the config stuff that's in there, uh, these will be auto-migrated, so you don't need to do that ahead of when you're uh, updating, because then you might get into a, like, if I have the new config, but the old version of Containerd might be a challenge. So um, you can still use the old config with the newer version of Containerd and migrate that a little bit later. Uh, and then once you've uh, remediated your warnings, you want to test and make sure that they don't recur. So continue to run your workloads. Um, one note here is that Containerd clears the information about um, deprecations when we restart Containerd. So that means you might need to restart Containerd to start to start it back at zero, uh, or if you're on a cloud provider, you can go ahead and create new nodes instead of using your existing nodes. Um, so once you've run your workloads for a while, you've tested, made sure that nothing's going to recur, uh, you can try upgrading to Containerd 2.0. And I think like any sort of best practice here would be to use test clusters or test nodes, some some way of doing uh, making sure that you're you're testing it before you're rolling it out to your full production. And then once you're ready, you go ahead and upgrade. Um, upgrade your clusters and upgrade your production. And I want to highlight here, Containerd 2.0 just came out last week. There's no immediate rush to go and upgrade. Like, of, of course you can if you were excited about the new features and we're, we're happy for you to do that, we're happy to support that, but Containerd 1.6 and 1.7 are going to be around here for a while. Containerd 1.6 is a long-term supported release of Containerd uh, and we'll be continuing to uh, apply bug fixes, apply security patches, uh, apply performance fixes um, and continue to make sure that it's working with newer versions of Kubernetes all the way up until we've got a replacement uh, long-term supported version of Containerd 1.6. And we haven't figured out what that's going to be yet. So for the foreseeable future, 1.6 is going to stay around. It's just not going to get the new features that are present in, in 2.0 or future releases of Containerd. 1.7 is also an active uh, supported release of Containerd at least for the next six months. Um, which means that we're going to continue to do all, all the same kinds of things that we're doing for 1.6, for 1.7, for six months. And then after six months, at this point, we're expecting to transition to what we call extended support, where we'll be primarily be doing security fixes and not really bug performance or uh, making it work with newer versions of Kubernetes. Um, and the extended support period, period for 1.7 is actually going to continue as long as 1.6 is supported with LTS. This is something that we're doing to sort of ease the transition around the 2.0 boundary, um, especially for clients that are consuming via um, Go modules and have some fun rules with that. Um, but that means that there's no immediate rush to go and update to 2.0 if you're not ready for it. You can take a measured approach to finding out whether you're going to have impact and making sure that your impact is really remediated before you take the step of doing an upgrade. Um, and I want to talk here a little bit that providers can help with this too. Um, I work on GKE, and we're, we're thinking about how do we help our customers prepare for Containerd 2.0 and make sure that they're going to upgrade successfully as well. Right now, we're, we tie our Containerd version with a specific Kubernetes version, and we're planning on uh, adopting Containerd 2.0 and GKE 1.33. And we're doing a bunch of work right now to make sure that this is going to be successful. Things like we'll be taking those deprecation warnings that Containerd exposes and then propagating them up into node conditions, which means that you can view them as part of kubectl. Uh, and you don't actually have to SSH into every node to see what the impact is going to be. We're also then going to be ingesting these and surfacing them into the, the Google Cloud Console, along with recommendations on how specifically you can remediate them. Um, and then GKE's automatic upgrades are going to take all of this into account. So if you have active things that might be causing you impact, we're not going to go and upgrade your cluster out from under you and put you on a version that's going to break you. Um, I'm, I'm not sure other what other providers' plans are. I'm sure that they're going to likely do something pretty similar here. There's nothing that, that GK is doing that anyone else can't do. Um, but I just wanted to speak a little bit about this because this is what I work on as well. Um, 
So with all of that said, I want to I want to do some highlights on um, some of the things that you can do to actually remediate and find out how to actually fix stuff. So Docker schema one images, I talked about this uh, earlier as one of the things that we think might be a little bit more impacting. This is the first the first type of Docker image that was uh, that could have been built by Docker way back when Docker first came around, um, like over a decade ago, and was replaced by Docker Schema 2 10 years ago in 2014, and then later sort of superseded by the OCI image format in 2017. Which means that if you've got images that are built any time in the past 10 years, they should probably be already Schema 2 or OCI images and not Schema 1. Um, if you have images that are schema one, they're, they're either built by very old tooling or they are very old images. And um, I, I would recommend not running software that's been around you know, older than 10 years and expect that to still be secure and supportable and, and not have bugs anymore. So um, sort of the easiest thing to do is to move to a newer image if you're using one that's really that old. Um, but you can also uh, sort of figure out how to um, convert those images as well. And Containerd Containerd can convert them for you. We never store uh, schema one images internally anyway. They're always converted on pull. So a really easy strategy if you've got an old image and you need to keep it around is you pull it into Containerd and then immediately push it back into your registry of choice. And that will do the conversion for you into an OCI image. Um, Containerd records the specific images that are schema one as part of our conversion process. And so you can find those by looking at the CTR tool and querying for the label that we apply. Um, that label will tell you not just that it is a schema one image, but the value of the label is the digest of the schema one image before we've converted it. And so you can trace that back to um, the specific image that is there. Uh, and then we have disabled schema one support by default in Containerd 2.0, but you can re-enable it. There are some nuances here, and we've got a doc that I've linked in a later slide that goes and describes specifically how to do that. But um, we are planning on removing it entirely for 2.1. Uh, another thing I want to highlight here is CRI v1 alpha 2. This was an older um, API version that Kubernetes used for controlling the container runtimes and was replaced by v1 in Kubernetes 1.23. And we're at 1.32 now, so it's been around for a while. V1's been around for a while, um, which means if you're using a, a modern kubelet, it's already using the correct version. Um, other workloads that are talking to the container runtime might still be using uh, v1 alpha 2. And these might be things like monitoring workloads or security scanners. Um, if you find any usage of v1 alpha 2 in your cluster, those are the components that uh, I would look at first. You can also sort of look at um, if you've got workloads that are privileged or workloads that are doing a bind mount of the containerd socket. Um, those are specific ones that might be more impacted as those are actually having access to the containerd socket to control it. Um, as I said here, we had a little bit of uh, um, one, 1721 and 1636 are the, the patch versions of 17 and 16 that have accurate data on CRI usage. We had a little bit of inaccurate data in the beginning, but um, those will tell you exactly when the last time those API versions were used. And you can see, like, was it used three weeks ago and I have to look at a, a workload that's not currently running or is it, is it actually being used right now and I have something in my cluster that's going and hitting that endpoint today. I also want to highlight um, something else that is not a deprecation but um, sort of a, a back-end change that we've done to the CRI implementation of Containerd. Um, in Containerd 1.7, we introduced the experimental sandbox service and in Containerd 2.0, we've stabilized that. And we've rewritten the back end of the CRI implementation in Containerd to use the sandbox service. We did a lot of that work in 1.7, which means you can try this out in 1.7. It's just not turned on by default um, if you want to try that separately from the rest of the 2.0 changes. Um, we don't expect this to be impactful. Um, there can always be bugs lurking, but uh, this isn't a breaking change. This is just sort of a larger back end change that might, you might want to be aware of. Uh, everything else pretty much has direct replacements. Um, this link here is the full table of everything that's changed, what you can replace it with, when it changed, um, all of those things. Deprecation warnings that come out as part of CPR deprec CTR deprecations list is going to have effectively the same information, just tailored to the specific things that you're running into. But the full list is on the website. Um, 
And then the one, one thing that is a, a breaking thing that we can't really detect is the use of IOU ring. Um, but our expectation here is that applications are going to degrade gracefully rather than uh, break with that change. If you run into challenges with this, we have resources available to help. Um, we have a document in our repo that describes in a lot of detail a bunch of the stuff that we've got in containerd2.0, uh, as well as our, our release notes for 2.0 that are, that are fairly long um, and discuss every single change. Uh, and then we've got a discussion forum available on GitHub uh, where we do Q&A and come, for, come to us for help. Uh, we're happy to, to answer questions there. Um, we're also available on Slack, uh, in the CNCF Slack, we have a containerd channel. Um, that link will give you an invite to it. Uh, and if you're really stuck and really want to talk to someone, um, we've got community meetings that we operate on the, the second and fourth Thursdays of the month. Um, you can check the CNCF calendar for the time in your time zone. So 2.0 just came out. What's next in 2.1? Uh, we're starting to put that milestone together now. Um, there's a couple things that I'm pretty, pretty excited about. Um, first one here that just barely didn't quite make it into 2.0, uh, but we'll get into 2.1 pretty quickly, is OCI image volume source. This is a newer KEP um, that, that sort of just came out, just was proposed, uh, and has entered alpha in 1.32, but we don't yet have the implementation in Containerd. The focus of this KEP is allowing you to um, expose data sets, or like large data sets, uh, as container images and attach them to your pods. Uh, and that gives you a good mechanism for distribution of large read-only data sets that you're going to run across your cluster the same way that you distribute the actual software that you're going to run. So you can specify a container image as a volume in your pod, in your pod spec, and then it's just a volume from there. Um, we're really excited about this. We've got a, an implementation that's in review right now. We're going to work through that and then get it into 2.1. Um, we're also going to continue to do some improvements to uh, sandboxes, the sandbox service and sandbox servers, which are the plugin mechanism there. I, I didn't really talk too much in depth about this yet, but um, the sandbox service really helps um, for alternative sort of VM-based runtimes and other use cases that need to have um, more detailed information about the group of containers that makes up a pod than Containerd previously had as it's part of its internal data. Um, so we're going to make some. We're going to continue improvements there. We've got uh, an issue that has a bunch of detailed information on um, what still needs to be done. Um, we've got some stuff uh, coming for improvements in terms of pull speed, uh, which I think most people are going to care about, especially as we get larger and larger and larger container images. Um, uh, we'll, we will be integrating CRI with the transfer service, which will unlock things like the image verifier plugins that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to look at the replacement for the auths config, which is probably going to be something like a credential manager plugin. Uh, we have some thoughts about that, but not, uh, it's not, not a full proposal for how we're going to do that yet. But all of these things are on the docket for 2.1, uh, and then we've got a milestone there that has more things. Of course, we're always you know, happy to add more things if, if there's uh, issues or proposals or uh, things like that that people want to see in 2.1. Um, I also want to touch a little bit on the timeline, 2.0 took a, a pretty long time to come out compared to the previous release cycle that we've had. We, don't, we have not settled on exactly what we're, our plans are for uh, 2.1, but our expectation is that it's not going to take nearly as long as 2.0 came out. 2.0 was a major transition because it was a major version bump, and we won't have that with 2.1. So 2.1 should come out on a much faster basis than we had for 2.0. Um, we have another session this afternoon that's a maintainer session um, where it's going to be me and then four of the other Containerd maintainers, and we're just going to sit around and talk about sort of project direction, um, history, uh, vision, all this, all sorts of fun things. I'm really excited about it. I think it'll be a fun, fun discussion. Love for you all to come join us. That's at um, 2:55 this afternoon uh, in the the Hyatt Level Four Regency Ballroom. Uh, and then at this point, I want to open up for uh, Q&A. And uh, Phil, who's sitting up in the front row, is another maintainer, is going to walk around with a mic. So feel free to raise your hands if you've got questions, and Phil will come out. And... Okay, thank you for your presentation. And uh, some fe new features, uh, especially user namespace with a pod, depend on the launch version, right? So because container user launch features have comment. So is there any documentation uh, that makes uh, them easier to understand 
So what's the launch version and uh, enable the content is uh, is a namespace with a pod or feature. I don't know that we have existing documentation that covers that, but that's a really good point for something that we can add. Um, you're right that it's going to depend on the run C version. It also depends on the kernel version. Um, so we'll, we'll need to document both of those. But yeah, that's that's something we can certainly add. OK, thank you. Uh, I have another question. OK, does OCI and volume source take into account uh, CRI configurations? OCI, the OCI? Uh, OCI image volume uh, source, or uh, OCI volume uh, source takes into account our CRI configurations? I don't think there's anything in the cap that talks about CRI configuration right now. It's just the, um, unless you're asking, like, does the, the particular runtime support it? Which, so we, there is a keying based on whether the runtime supports that feature, but um, I don't think there's anything beyond that. Mike, Mike up in front would have more. <laughs> it, the actual implementation is using the same code path that we use for regular container images. So, so yes. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Actually, it's sort of interesting. So what we're doing through OCI volume is the pod spec defines what it's going to be, but we don't pull it yet. When, when they actually do the create container, we check to see if you've got a target path right, in the volume list. And then we go ahead and fill in the contents. We create our own local host you know, ex extract of it, but not as a root FS. And then we do a bind mount from that image that's going to be shared across all the containers, okay, in that pod to whatever locations you wanted to pull. And we're also going to be adding a set path. So you'll be able to select the portions of the image that you want and mount that into a particular destination path. Okay. Okay, uh, looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, I'm gonna hang around after the containerity maintainers who are here probably will hang around after if you wanna talk to us. Uh, and we've got the maintainer session um, later this afternoon, so any questions that you have then. Um, a brief note here, I would love to have your feedback on the session. I'm gonna show a QR code in a minute. Um, anything that you were excited to learn about, anything that I can improve uh, in terms of the session content or clarity or anything like that. Um, but yeah, uh, happy to have that. So. Here's the code for session feedback. Thank you.